Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the very first Sexual Violence Task Force Roundtable conducted virtually. Thank you to everyone who is joining us via Facebook Live and thank you to my co-chairs, Representative Jackie Spear from California, Representative David Joyce from Ohio and Representative John Katko from New York. Our world has changed dramatically since our task force last convened. COVID-19 is requiring new approaches to combat abuse and sexual violence, and the timing could not be more urgent as countless lives literally hang in the balance. It's also painfully clear that whenever the pandemic eases, it will still leave behind long-term ramifications for survivors of sexual assault and abuse and for those who support them. In my home state of New Hampshire, crisis centers are seeing an influx of calls, and our statewide hotline has seen a 44% increase in the number of calls coming in since March. It's also alarming to see a growing proportion of these calls involve very severe abuse with a high risk of a deadly outcome. This means that survivors are often experiencing escalated levels of violence before they can even reach out for help. And tragically, these numbers only count those survivors who are able to reach out at all. That said, I'm pleased to see our state courts recently adopted a new electronic filing process for survivors to submit domestic violence and stalking protective orders remotely with the support of crisis center advocates. This is important because the filing of new protective orders has dropped significantly since the pandemic began, and yet we know that there are many survivors who are literally shut in their home with their perpetrators uh, and those that mean to do them harm. Across the country, we are hearing stories of new challenges. Shelters are trying to establish social distance protocols and yet remain open. Educators are trying to make mechanisms available for children to safely report abuse. And one of the biggest issues we face is that young people no longer have a safe haven with a teacher or a social worker in the school and need help. Advocates are trying to find affordable housing for survivors at a time when so many are suddenly housing insecure. And there's so much to understand about how to address and prevent violence in this new normal that we're living in and how Congress can be helpful in doing so. So with that in mind, I'm truly pleased to introduce our panel of experts that will help us today to dive deeper into these issues. Camille Cooper is the Vice President of Public Policy at the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, known as RAIN, the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization that also operates the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Alejandra Castilla is the CEO of YWCA USA, which serves 2.3 million women and girls around the country with a network of over 200 associations and their work to address and prevent violence has never been more essential. Dr. April Alexander is an associate professor at the University of Denver and directs the Denver Forensic Institute for Research, Service, and Training. She has an extensive research background in subjects pertaining to violence and trauma-informed care for survivors. And Michelle Delon is the Chief Operating Officer of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and she and her colleagues are on the front lines of protecting children during this pandemic. We're honored to have all of you here for this important conversation. And with that, I will yield the floor to Mr. Joyce for his opening remarks. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for your willingness to participate today. I wish we could all be together in person, uh, but I want to thank Representative Custer, my fellow co-chairs, Representative Katko and Spire, for ensuring these important discussions are still able to take place. Over 100,000 Americans have died from COVID-19 and millions have lost their jobs. However, the disease uh, vicious impact spreads well beyond these tragic figures. It has left countless women and children at greater risk for sexual and domestic violence. And unfortunately, in an effort to slow the virus, those at greatest risk for such violence have lost access to the resources that are often vital 
to escaping abuse. So I want to thank each of our panelists for continuing their ever important work during these trying times. I look forward to hearing how Congress can best be of assistance to your agencies and support your efforts to provide victims of violence the resources they need during this global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. And now Representative Spear, would you like to join us for opening remarks? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and to my uh, co-chairs of the task force and to our uh, esteemed witnesses who we'll hear from. Uh, I regret I'm going to be getting on a plane shortly, so I'm, I want to make sure I get to listen to their testimony. I'll just be very brief in saying uh, I got a very um, important and painful wake-up call about domestic violence when I got a letter from a constituent that was typed and anonymous that said, um, please let our uh, people, our husbands go back to work because um, now that he's home all day long, he's abusing me and my children. At least when he was working, he'd come home, have dinner, drink, and fall asleep watching TV. Oh, God. Um, so um, it underscores what you have already said, Madam Chair, which is that um, the numbers are up, but they're up in a very strange way because uh, they oftentimes cannot actually make a phone call because their abuser is right there. And as we see the numbers of unemployed skyrocket, um, I, I fear these numbers are going to get even greater. So uh, I hope our our witnesses today will be able to give us some advice on how we can protect uh, families that um, are in this situation now where their abuser is with them 24 seven. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Katko, would, would you like to say some opening remarks? Sure, and thank you very much for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, today's round table is critically important to better understand the unique challenges and barriers faced by organizations on the front line during this crisis. And uh, I've engaged uh, repeatedly with Vera House in Central New York, which is on the front lines of this crisis. And uh, I was informed before I got on this call that domestic violence uh, uh, police calls have gone up 12%. And those are ones where they have the ability to call because the, the person is not in the room or uh, what have you. So I, I suspect the incidents are even higher. Uh, in Central New York, like the rest of the country, there's been an increase in both domestic violence and calls to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. At the same time, shelters and crisis centers are facing limitations on available services and resources, as well as restrictions on their ability to provide uh, critical services uh, to the individuals. The highly contagious nature of COVID-19 has also brought about a new, net of, uh, new set of challenges for staff on the front lines as they work to provide continued service. While I'm pleased that the CARES Act provided critically important resources to address some of these challenges, including $45 million to the Family Violence um, Act, uh, it's, it, it's not enough. So uh, going forward, I hope that we can uh, continue to work together. I look forward to the dialogue here. I look forward to working with my colleagues. It's good to see all of you. And uh, up until recently, I was always with, I hope everybody is uh, well and healthy. Now we have to add to that, uh, well, healthy, and uh, safe. And uh, I, I, I wish the best to all of you, and I, I yield back. Thank you very much, Representative Katko. And uh, thank you for bringing up, I just, as we head into the remarks here from our panelists, I do want to just reference, so the CARES Act that we passed in a bipartisan way and uh, out of the House and Senate and signed into law, provided $45 million for the Family Violence Prevention Services Act and $2 million for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, the, the next package of legislation that's currently pending in the Senate called the HEROES Act includes 100 million in funding for the Violence Against Women Act programs, along with a waiver of the matching fund requirements. And that includes 30 million for grants to combat violence against women, 15 million for transitional housing assistance grants, 15 million for sexual assault victims assistance, 10 million for rural domestic violence and child abuse enforcement assistance, and 10 million for legal assistance for victims. So um, to feel free throughout your remarks if there are specific programs
programs that we should be focused on, um, please, please feel free and we'll keep track and maybe we'll be able to work together as a task force on uh, funding for your important programs. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Camille Cooper, Vice President of Public Policy at RAIN. Thank you, Camille, for being with us. Absolutely, thank you for the invitation. Uh, Madam Chair, Custer, and Honorable Co-Chairs, Congresswoman Speer, Congressman Joyce, and Congressman Kako, thank you for inviting me to participate today to highlight important issues impacting survivors of sexual violence. My name is Camille Cooper. I am Vice President of Public Policy for RAIN, the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. We created and operate the National Sexual Assault Hotline as well as the DOD Safe Health Line, and we work in partnership with over a thousand local sexual assault service providers across the country. Uh, we also carry out programs to prevent sexual violence, support victims, and ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. As you know, sexual violence is a pervasive problem in the United States and across the globe. Every community is impacted by these crimes and almost everyone knows someone who has experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. I'd like to focus my remarks on some of the most pressing needs for survivors and ways in which the COVID-19 crisis has inhibited the ability of survivors to access resources, care, and protection. RAIN's Victim Service Program serve more than 25,000 people per month. We provide services for anyone who needs them, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender identity, or age. As states began to implement shelter-in-place orders in early March, we began to see a very troubling trend on our national sexual assault online hotline. There, this is the preferred means of con country. In the first three weeks in March, minors for the first time ever in our history on our hotline were over 50% of our users. While our hotline is anonymous and confidential, we do track trends in the types of requests being made by users, and that informs our services and also our public policy work. In March, children were seeking help because the majority of them were quarantined with their abuser in the home. They had lost access to critical support structures such as teachers and other mandated reporters and safe spaces such as their schools. Many also said that the abuse that they were suffering was increasing in both frequency and severity. These children described very violent assaults and one in five of them asked to be connected directly to emergency services while speaking to our staff. Last September, the New York Times published a series on children who had been exploited over the internet. They described an unchecked and flourishing black market for images depicting the rape and torture of children, most of whom are sexually abused and photographed by someone in their own family or circle of trust. So there's a big crossover here between the population we're seeing on our hotline and children that are also exploited on them. As a nation, we need to place this epidemic of child sexual abuse front and center and make it the highest priority of all of our collective policy efforts. In addition to children's increased vulnerability and risk during the COVID-19 crisis, adult sexual assault victims were confused about where to seek care, exams, and court orders. They were also extremely reluctant to seek medical care in hospital settings out of fear of being infected with the virus. As a result of local services being limited in an effort to contain the coronavirus, demand for hotline services increased across the board, including for sexual assault, domestic violence, suicide prevention, and crisis intervention. As our nation grapples with how to implement a national coordinated response to COVID-19 and what will likely be multiple waves of infection, we are also challenged to face another crisis one that is both historical and where the response is long overdue. Police bias impacts everyone. In the sexual violence space, it can be the difference between disbelieving or believing a victim and allowing very serious offenders to escape accountability. Whether it's making sure that we fully fund the effort to eliminate the rape kit backlog or addressing the needs of vulnerable populations and their access to services, we need the support of elected leaders like yourselves now more than ever. Uh, I'll be happy to get into specifics about the, um, the issues and the 
um, the bills and legislative activity that we're working on with all of you um, during the discussion portion. Thank you for allowing me to participate today. Thank you very much, Camille. And it's disturbing, but all the more important to be having these conversations. Um, I should have said at the outset that we did invite press to join the call. And um, so we will do our best to help get the word out and to come up with constructive uh, solutions. With that, I want to invite uh, Alexandra Castillo. I'm sorry, I said, uh, said that wrong before. The CEO of YWCA. Uh, USA. And thank you so much, Alexandra, for being with us. Good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you, Representative Custer, the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence and its Congressional Co-Chairs. Thank you for, the invi uh, for inviting me to this virtual roundtable discussion to address COVID-19's impact on sexual and domestic violence survivors and service providers. I'm honored to join my other panelists, Camille Cooper, Dr. April Alexander, Michelle Delon. My name is Alejandra Castillo and I serve as the CEO of YWCA USA. As you may know, YWCA USA reaches over 2.3 million women and girls, as well as families, through a network of more than 200 local associations in 45 states and the District of Columbia. We touch over a thousand communities across this country. We provide critical programs, including domestic and, and sexual violence services through our 12,500 staff members, as well as 52,000 volunteers. We are the largest network of domestic and sexual violence service providers. Annually, we provide 535,000 women, children, and families with safe and secure housing, counseling, court assistance, and other community safety programs. During these uncertain times of COVID-19, shelter-in-place restrictions take on a new meaning for victims of domestic violence. Just as you are seeing in the news and hearing from advocates, those sheltering at home face the risk of an additional pandemic, the rise in domestic violence due to social distancing guidelines. With workplace and community closures, many victims are finding themselves trapped in the same quarters with their abusers. Now, the feeling of isolation and fear experienced by victims during the pandemic are further compounded by the economic crises and the recent violence and death of people of color in America due to police brutality. Our clients are scared, but at YWCA, we are committed to keeping survivors safe while meeting the increased demand for services. We are determined to continue being a place that families and survivors can turn to for support. In response to COVID-19, YWCA USA has been regularly collecting survey data from our local associations to better understand the challenges and policy solutions needed to maintain services and meet increased demand. Among responses from our survey of local YWCA associations during the month of April and early May, 61% of YWCA domestic and sexual violence hotlines reported an increase in calls due to the pandemic. 46% of YWCAs who, who provide domestic violence services reported an increase in demand. And 47% of YWCA's domestic violence shelter reported an increase in demand for emergency housing. As you can imagine, there are increased staffing and programming costs for services as a result of the large increase in service requests. These, this has resulted in YWCA providing quickly reaching their service capacity. In fact, some, YWC, some YWCAs have seen an increase in client population as high as 250%. Take for example, our sisters at YWCA Greater Cincinnati. Staff have made several adjustments to their domestic violence programming, including moving clients to motels for safety reasons. Costs for motels to house, house clients, as well as security guards to protect their safety, are now upwards of $38,000 per week. This is just one example of the many unique and complex challenges YWCAs continue to face across the country during the pandemic. YWCA staffs are regularly ch uh, changing and adjusting their operations to meet demands while addressing the unpredictable health and safety concerns that come with COVID-19 and keeping survivors and their families safe. Despite the challenges, we are pleased to report 
that all but four of our local associations have, who have provided domestic and sexual violence services and who have responded to our sur sur survey have been able to continue accepting new clients. YWCA is grateful for the initial action Congress took through the CARES Act to address immediate funding, staffing, and safety needs caused by COVID-19 pandemic. Although the CARES Act did not include new funding for VAWA, the emergency funding recently re released by OMB for the Family Violence Prevention and Service Act, FIPSA, will be critical to helping with these unexpected costs. The CARES Act was a critical first step, but much more is needed so nonprofits like YWCA can continue to employ our workers and deliver services critical to the current response and future economic recovery. Now, as attention turns to the U.S. Senate, YWCA continues to advocate for maintaining and strengthening the following five provisions identified in the next COVID-19 response bill. First, we call for a robust funding for domestic and sexual violence providers through FIPSA, VAWA, VOCA, and HUD programs. This life-saving funding is vital to the efforts to keep survivors safe, and these programs enjoy broad bipartisan support. One example that I know the task force support is VAWA sexual assault service programs. Emergency funding will be used to respond to current requests from survivors for support and assistance with the new service requests and more dire requests coming from current clients. Second, we urge swift action to extend the loan forgiveness program a loan forgiveness period in the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, and maintain full loan forgiveness for small and mid-sized nonprofits to ensure that they can avoid crippling layoffs and maintain the heart and soul of their operation, their staff, regularly the frontliners working to serve their community. Third, we also call on senators to recognize the essential work of many nonprofits employees, particularly child care and domestic violence providers and social service workers, by including them in the definition of essential workers who are eligible for hazard pay. YWCA continues to open their, the doors to essential workers and provide a critical lifeline to individuals throughout the community. This is the least we can do for our frontliners workers to recognize their life-saving efforts. Fourth, Next, ensure maximum flexibility in use of funding so that domestic and sexual violence survivors providers can utilize funds as needed, including to ensure that staff and survivors are kept healthy and safe from COVID-19. And finally, we, ad we advocate for the waiver of match requirements. Waivers of match requirements enable YWCA and other service providers to offer FIPS of funded services despite declining in the volunteer hours and fundraising that enable nonprofit to meet match requirements. We urge all members to include match waivers to future COVID relief legislation. Members of this esteemed task force, our country is in crisis and we have reached a moment of reckoning. COVID-19 has affected everyone's lives in new and unexpected ways. These experiences have only been further compounded and compounded and the desperation for action has been deepened as we mourn the tragic and senseless murder of George Floyd and so many others at the hands of police brutality. As YWCA continues to stand on the front, at the front lines and bear the physical, emotional, and mental brunt of meeting community needs in the midst of this pandemic, we implore you to support domestic and sexual violence service providers in future stimulus relief packages, and we need your help now. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before this task force, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure all survivors find the safety and support they need. We, can we continue to stand together with communities all across America to live our mission to eliminate racism and empower women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandra. Very, very well spoken. And um, <clears throat> thank you as well for your task force to-do list. We appreciate it. Um, let me just say a couple of those items have been addressed. Uh, most notably, you've mentioned the PPP program, and I know a number of nonprofits, including uh, YWCA's and uh, sexual assault, domestic violence shelters, et cetera, have applied. We, uh, the House has voted to reform the program to go from eight weeks to 24 weeks. That was just passed in the Senate and should be headed to the president's desk. It also provides for a little more flexibility for the program uh, beyond payroll. So 
Um, we hope that those that will be helpful. <clears throat> With regard to the VAWA funding, I think I mentioned at the top that we have included that in the HEROES Act and will continue to advocate for funding for uh, domestic violence, sexual assault programming and shelters. And thank you, um, we did include the waiver of the match in that HEROES Act funding, but we'll continue to keep that in mind as we move forward. So very, very helpful, very effective advocacy. Thank you. All right, and with that, uh, Dr. April Alexander is joining us and thank you for being with us. Associate Professor at the University of Denver and Director of the Denver Forensic Institute for Research, Service and Training, known as Denver First. And thank you very much, Dr. Alexander, for being with us. Welcome. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, thank you to the task force uh, for bringing up this critical issue at such an important time uh, in our country right now. I just want to speak to a little bit of the context that some of our previous panelists have provided thus far. Interpersonal violence and childhood abuse have been long considered significant public health concerns. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted institutional and systemic inequalities throughout the United States many which contribute to the current public health problems. Housing and food insecurity, access to health and mental health resources, and unemployment have all been issues that states have been trying to individually address even more than ever. These disparities are even more pronounced among people of color and LGBTQ populations. When thinking about interpersonal violence and child abuse, finding ways to provide adequate services and resources to victims during this COVID-19 crisis is really important. Physical distancing has been one of the major recommendations for reducing the spread of COVID-19 in communities. As a result, stay-at-home orders were issued throughout the country. But one of the unintended consequences of these orders was the potential for increase in interpersonal violence and child abuse. Isolation has always been a factor in these cases and stay-at-home orders increase the potential for harm. In examining the potential outcomes of COVID, researchers have examined other crises, like nat national disasters. Following Hurricane Harvey, researchers uh, found that stress associated with disasters led to higher rates of both domestic violence and childhood abuse during and after the hurricane. Our previous panelists have remarked on the increased rates of local and national hotline calls, especially calls by children. However, in some states, hotline calls have decreased which has advocates worried that people don't have the means to report or seek help. Mental health practitioners have turned the telehealth services, but that might not be an option for victims who live with their abuser. Further, space in homeless and domestic violence shelters and transitional living facilities has decreased as unemployment rates have risen. As states and cities have begun to open back up through phase two or safer at home measures, I have concerns about resources and capacity to provide services to victims and survivors. For instance, many children have been engaging in virtual schooling without direct access to mandatory reporters such as teachers um, to find them support. Once they've returned back to their systems like summer camps here in Colorado are opening or they go back to fall classes, are we going to see a reemergence in reporting of child abuse? How will this affect social service agencies, child welfare systems, and family violence centers? In thinking about addressing COVID-19, we must think about how the effects of violence impact our systems over time. As Congress and state legislators are navigating continued uh, COVID emergency funding or CARES funding, it is hoped continued funding to interpersonal violence response is explicitly addressed. Additionally, I wanna think about violence prevention. As we, have, uh, as we are taking measures to reduce the spread of COVID-19, we can do the same with interpersonal violence. Interpersonal violence and child abuse are preventable. The economic burden of child sexual abuse alone is estimated to be $9.3 billion. What if we invested in preventing abuse and violence from happening or occurring in the first place? Evidence-based approaches to interpersonal violence, such as workshops on boundaries and healthy relationships, or consent education are prevention measures that work in reducing victimization. Preventing acts of violence will strengthen families and our communities to be resilient in future public health crises. In thinking about a post-COVID world, 
I hope that we take the lessons that we learned about our current systemic inequities that were exacerbated by this pandemic and take some steps to correct them. Again, thank you for your time on this panel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander, and thank you for bringing up prevention. And uh, I'll want to get into that in my questions, but I, I think it's critically important and that we um, do take stock, assess what the um, challenges have been. And as we come out of this, I've said over and over on similar calls, we're going to have a pre-COVID, post-COVID world. You know, in our minds, we're going to be um, thinking of, I think the term 2020 hindsight is going to have all new meaning, but that we're going to be thinking of the world in different ways. And now that we are more online, what, what benefits can come of that in terms of uh, telehealth and what are the challenges for, um, I have parts of my district that are very rural where they're getting better health care now and better access to mental health in particular because they don't have to drive an hour and through the snow and over the mountain to get there. So, um, but thank you. I appreciate you being with us. And, um, and last on our panel, thank you to Michelle DeLon, Chief Operating Officer of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I think this is a really important link uh, that we've learned about this morning is this link between uh, sexual assault and abuse and, and exploitation and the internet. So thank you, Michelle, for being with us. Thank you, Representative, and uh, good afternoon to all. My name is Michelle Delon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I wanna thank this task force for including neck neck in this important conversation and sharing our perspectives on how COVID-19 has impacted online child sexual exploitation. NECMEC is a private nonprofit organization founded more than 35 years ago by Reve and John Walsh um, and other child advocates after the tragic abduction and murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh. And today, NECMEC serves as the congressionally designated National Clearinghouse on Missing and Exploited Children Issues. Today, we operate a range of programs that help prevent and resolve missing and exploited children cases and provide services to families and children. Over the past two years, or I'm sorry, two decades, we have witnessed tremendous uh, evolution and growth in the vo uh, volume of online child exploitation. And since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began earlier this year, we have seen an alarming increase in the exploitation of children online, as well as new methods being used by predators to entice our children uh, into sexual abuse online. Our core program to combat online child sexual exploitation is the Cyber Tip Line, which is an online mechanism for members of the public and the tech industry to report incidents of child sexual exploitation. Uh, the reports that we receive include um, those of distribution of child sexual abuse material, child sex trafficking, online enticement of children, and other sexual crimes. And our main goal in operating the cyber tip line is to prioritize those reports where a child is, is at uh, immediate danger, as well as determine when um, and where a recorded incident may have occurred, so we can get that report to the appropriate law enforcement agency for their review. Since we created the cyber tip line 22 years ago, we have received more than 72 million reports of uh, suspected online sexual exploitation of children. Uh, last year alone in 2019, almost 17 million reports, which contained close to 70 million pieces of child sexual abuse material, images, and videos. Uh, so far, just this year, in the last five months, more than 10 million reports have come uh, in, uh, and the volume has increased, as has the complexity of the cases. In recent years, we have seen uh, an increase in reports related to online enticement and sextortion of children. Online enticement occurring when um, all types of different platforms where an offender is communicating with a child involves uh, luring a child to create sexually explicit images, engage in sexual conversations, perhaps meet in person. And sextortion is a particularly disturbing form of enticement because the offender actually uses non-physical coercion, such as blackmail, to acquire more sexually explicit material from a child um, or engage in sex with that child. Since the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders were put in place nationwide and around the world, we have seen an explosion um, in the increase of reports that we've received to the cyber tip line. During March and May of last year, with, uh, as opposed to this year, we have more than doubled the number of cases that have been received. In fact, in April, um, our cyber tip line reports were 300% higher than they were in April of last year. 
And we see a, a number of factors that are actually contributing to this. One, there's a huge increase in the number of people who are staying home, um, which means more people are spending time online and children are spending more time online with school being closed. Uh, that also means that more people are seeing and thankfully reporting uh, child sexual exploitation when they um, witness it. And unfortunately, offenders are also keenly more aware that children are home. And we have um, seen graphic discussions on the dark web among offenders who are comparing notes on how to take advantage of stay-at-home orders, the fact that parents in many cases are providing less supervision because they're balancing their own responsibilities with work. And these offenders are talking about how uh, they can entice and lure children into producing more sexually explicit material. Um, and enticement, we are seeing offenders also, a marked increase in the number of reports we're receiving of offenders who are talking with children about exploiting them um, and uh, receiving images. If you compare spring of 2019 with spring of 2020, we've seen an enormous uh, increase in the reports. In fact, in April and May, it was 163% more than last year. So what are we doing about it? Since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have shifted our prevention messaging uh, to parents and specifically addressing them and families who are homeschooling and confronting online safety issues like they never have before. We produced a series of blogs and educational materials and resources that are available on our website at missingkids.com. And we also continue to provide free of charge, age appropriate safety and prevention resources, which focus on both online and in-person uh, safety. With more people online and using new ways to connect, especially with video conferencing, we have been uh, crafting messages to help the public better understand online sexual exploitation. We're encouraging people to report any type of uh, potentially exploitative material regarding a child to the cyber tip line and to law enforcement. I wanna thank you for giving NECMEC the opportunity to appear today, share our experiences and how we're combating online child exploitation. And we look forward to continuing to be a resource to this task force as you continue your important work. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you and your staff does. I'm uh, thinking it, it extremely disturbing, but all the more important to get the word out and to educate parents and adults that uh, wanna protect children that may be unawares. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also wanna, uh, for all of you, um, my heart goes out to your staffs as well, because this is a challenging time. I know that the staffs of the domestic violence shelters and social service agencies here in New Hampshire may be working from home, and I cannot imagine a worse job than the people that are screening those complaints and those images. So um, thank you for the important work that you do, and, and I'm sure um, Adam's family and, and his advocacy lives on. So thank you for that. You. So with that, we'll turn to our member questions. Uh, Mr. Joyce, would you like to kick us off? Is that good? You're going to have to unmute. Yep, Got it. there we go. Um, thank you all again. Uh, but Dr. Alexander, uh, you had men <clears throat> mentioned the concern that during the times of remote learning, children are losing access to mandatory abuse reporting. You also mentioned important work that your fellow panelists, Ms. Cooper and her colleagues have undertaken at RAIN. To quote your written testimony, by calls of children and teens have, written, have risen by 22% according to the Rape and Abuse and Illness National Network. 79% of the callers reported they were living with their abuser. I was proud to support a letter last month that was led by my fellow Ohio Representative Anthony Gonzalez to Secretary DeVos urging the U.S. Department of Education to issue guidance that will set clear standards for how school system can best utilize uh, online learning platforms to ensure children can report abuse. I'm curious as to your expert recommendations in this regard specifically. Are your organizations engaging and training educators to identify signs of abuse through remote learning and how they can replicate the program you have found effective in regard to this at the federal level? And additionally, how can remote learning on the ever popular platforms such as Zoom or Google Classroom be adapted to give students an opportunity to report abuse. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Representative Joyce, and um, just really excited to hear about the work that you recently did in that uh, sphere. I haven't heard of that, uh, so kudos uh, to you on that. Um, 
And there's so many different issues with this. One is access to virtual learning at this time. Uh, we still have kids who are struggling to uh, get connected. Uh, it was families without internet. Um, in Colorado, we had a lot of outreach on getting kids access to iPads and things to continue with virtual learning. One of our reporters here uh, interviewed some teachers and one teacher actually said, there are three students I haven't been in contact with since COVID hit. And so uh, again, I'm concerned, where are those three students? What is going on with them at this time? Um, are they some of our missing children at this time? Are they being harmed? Are they safe? Um, so that's another thing that's going through my mind. Um, obviously, when I'm talking about prevention and intervention, I would love to have a multidisciplinary approach to some of these topics. Um, so is there a way that we can use some of these online platforms to have a feature to do some of this reporting? Uh, again, some of this mechanism of not having connectedness with your teacher in the immediate sphere might not allow you to report. Um, so is there some way that we can um, integrate reporting mechanisms into uh, this technology? And uh, again, this was new. I haven't heard of it and thought of this idea until you brought it up. Um, so again, I would love to have a multidisciplinary kind of perspective on how we can best utilize technology, especially if a lot of schools are going to continue being online uh, through December. Great, thank you. And Dave, we could, um, you know, we can talk offline or our staffs can connect, but maybe there's an opportunity here. This seems like it's a good format, it's working for us, that we could do something to follow up on that and bring in the educators. And I know I've been talking with the school social workers here are very, very concerned and, you know, maybe bring in the tech, like we gotta figure out a way to work together and not right. be siloed in all the different places. Um, I, every single day for 12 weeks now, there is a moment where I say, my God, this impacts every aspect of every life <laughs> in our country. And there are moments when it's a little overwhelming for us to try to respond to all of it, but it's overwhelming for you being on the front lines of it. So, um, but I really like that idea, David. That's very innovative. I think it's a, it's along the lines of 9-11. There's going to be changes in the way we do business. So exactly. we need to focus on what those changes are and try and to get ahead. Make it, make it for the better, not, right. not, not slide back. Right, right. Um, Representative right. Spear, are you still able to join us by audio? Would you like to ask any questions? I do have one question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to ask all of the witnesses to um, explain express their thoughts. One of the um, ideas that's been floated that I think has a lot of merit is that we need to change the way we engage with those who are um, victims of abuse. That hotlines are great if you can get to a phone, but um, as we've witnessed with you know children in abusive families that can't speak when um, the abusive parent is there, um, are, what are we doing about creating a, a national, actually, um, red button that is available on Facebook or, or TikTok or um, Instagram that, I guess Facebook would be inappropriate for young kids in particular, <laughs> um, that would be a way for them to instantly um, access someone who can talk to them online as opposed to um, by telephone. Michelle, do you want to start off there? Or, oh, it sounds like looks like Camille has an answer. Let's let's go ahead with Camille and then Michelle and then uh, uh, Will, April and Alejandro. How about that, Camille? I think you have to do your um, you're on mute. Okay, I'm on. Is that, is that okay? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, first, I just want to address uh, Congressman Joyce's. Um, comments about uh, Congresswoman uh, Wasserman Schultz's and Congressman Gonzalez's effort to try to get that reporting function included in the online learning platform. Um, we worked closely with them on that and I have included a, a link to that congressional letter to Secretary of Education DeVos uh, to work on um, with regard to that issue. So that's in everyone's uh, chat box there. Um, uh, that's what he mentioned. 
Um, I, you know, Congresswoman Spear, I think that that's a very good idea. I think that children, children access our online hotline much more frequently than they are using the telephone to call us. And you're absolutely right that they are there in the home and the perpetrator is sort of, um, for lack of a better visual image, you know, around them and watching what they're doing. Um, one of the minors that contacted us recently said that she had to pretend to be doing homework online just to talk with us online to get the help that she needed because she did not have access to a telephone. Her uh, abuser would not allow her to use his mobile phone. So her only form of communication was Wi-Fi. Um, and that's how she was able to connect with us. And we were able to connect her directly with 911. Um, but I like, I really like this idea that you're talking about of having an online um, button. And I'm going to defer to Michelle at NCMEC on that. I think that Europe has tried to implement that. They have a report abuse button. Um, I'm not sure if it goes on everywhere um, globally, um, you know, across the pond, but um, I'm going to defer to her on that. But I do think that that's a very valid idea uh, moving forward. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Representative. Yes, um, the online reporting um, is uh, having a different way that victims don't need to pick up a phone and call and speak to somebody. On the cyber tip line, for instance, more than well more than 99% of our reports are coming in from people directly online who don't wish to pick up a phone and speak with anyone. It's hard enough to uh, talk about what's happening to them in the first place, never mind um, having to do it with a complete stranger on the phone. I think engagement with the tech industry is critical here. Um, almost every platform has the ability to make a report. Um, however, you often have to search um, high and low and go through a lot of different layers to report. Um, as we also just heard today, there are a lot of different types of um, uh, dangers that are uh, facing families at home and children at home and women at home, whether it be domestic violence, um, sexual abuse, um, you know, uh, anxiety, potential suicide risk. Um, there are a lot of different crises that individuals need to be able to find immediate help. Um, we always encourage and would um, very much be open to working with anyone in terms of um, finding easier ways on cross platforms, not platform specific, that allow people basically to have uh, the ability to go to a crisis point and then find the appropriate to vetted, uh, you know, reputable organizations that might be able to help them in a quick way. Again, we also recognize that many, many people never reach out, make a report or pick up the phone. So we also want to be able to give them helpful information, um, even if they're just looking for it online, so they might be able to take action when the time is correct. Great. Uh, Dr. Alexander, do you have anything to add? No, I'm echoing everything Michelle said. Again, we have to get creative in our approaches and collaborate with the tech industry on how to make this more visible. Excellent. And Alejandra? I'll just, uh, again, echo uh, everything that everyone has said. Um, I want to also emphasize uh, what Dr. Alexander mentioned in terms of the digital divide is still, is still a reality and, and also being culturally uh, responsive to uh, the needs of communities of color in particular in this in this arena but i also want to say you know as ywca we have also seen because um, some of our ywcas are still delivering um school lunches been a, we've still been able to see some of our students and and pick up uh some some of those telltale signs clearly under covid that is uh, restricted but we we've, we've still because we still have that community touch um, we're still one of those in those organizations that can pick up those telltale signs, but I welcome the collaboration because we definitely need to brainstorm and think of different ways to approach uh, approach these multitude of challenges. So um, uh, I'm ready, willing, and, and very excited to work with all of the colleagues around this uh, virtual roundtable. Uh, Madam Chair, if I, I could just um, conclude by saying, you know, if there ever was a reason to finally do um, universal um, access to uh, broadband. It is now. Yes. Uh, I know that in my district there are many children that are, even with hotspots, unable to get the education um, that is commonplace in the areas where there is um, you know, greater internet service. So um, for the reasons associated with um, violence in the home and for just overall educational opportunity and for, you know, the, the rural parts of our country that have not have access, I mean, I think Republicans and Democrats can join together on this one 
and make this a universal um, benefit to all. So I hope that maybe we can join with others in doing that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you, Representative Spear. I, I can't think of a better situated member of Congress to help us in outreach to the, um, to the companies, uh, the, the online companies, tech companies. And also just want to mention, um, I've been serving on Mr. Clyburn's uh, task force on access to rural broadband. Um, we will have, uh, we did have in the HEROES Act, and we will continue to press that going forward. Um, I've been reaching out to the telecom companies, the, the actual broadband companies themselves. And here in New Hampshire, we had a, I was very impressed. They were coordinating with the local school system and trying to identify each child, as you mentioned, Dr. Alexander, there were children that have not been to school since March. There's been no sign of them. And they were working with the school system to identify the family. And I have one company that signed up 300 families in this particular region for free internet access uh, and to make sure that those students can resume school schooling. That's not unlimited. Right now they've done it for 90 days. And yesterday I was on a call with the telecom companies down in DC to talk about how can we continue that going forward and make sure that every student in America, every household has access. Because between telework, telehealth, and um, teleeducation, and the health and safety and well-being of our of our constituents. So, and with that, uh, Mr. Katko, thank you for your patience. You're next up. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for convening this. This is um, uh, heartwarming and troubling at the same time. It's heartwarming because of all the good people that are dedicating their their professions to to this noble cause. Uh, I was a 20-year federal organized crime prosecutor, so I dealt with a lot of these cases um, that never cease to uh, uh, really just tug at your heartstrings more than anything. And I can go on chapter and verse on the types of cases, but one in particular, I remember having to call a 14-year-old a uh, person who was exploited over the internet by a three times uh, jailed sex offender who's in his trailer in Mississippi, uh, uh, getting her to take pictures of herself and then post them on the internet, then having to call the mother and tell her, that her valedictorian, you know, cheerleader, athlete, stu uh, daughter is all over the internet and she's been exploited. Um, that's just one example of the things I had to deal with. So the NCMEC was a, a big um, part of what we did in our offices. Uh, and then, you know, locally with the McMahon Wild Child Advocacy Center, you see a lot more of that, of what's going on. And uh, we're strong supporters of that. And of course, the Vera House for uh, similar issues with, uh, uh, you know, battered women and everything else, and it's um, abused women, and uh, it never ceased to amaze me how bad it can get. But um, when, when one thing you're talking about, and one thing we've kind of zeroed in on in this discussion has really kind of caught my attention more than anything, and that is uh, when children don't have access to broadband, uh, and children are far more tech savvy than us, uh, we're really denying them access to safety as well as education and 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 counseling. Uh, I know from this crisis that telehealth has kind of come of age and a lot more people are, are getting mental health treatment in their homes and the the the, the um no-show rate is dramatically less when people can get uh, telehealth in their homes so i think rural broadband is a critical component of what we do going forward i would also just add to that that if we have rural broadband uh, and connectivity with everyone going forward i think it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier for the, to encourage these kids through their own devices and not having to call and be on top, even on their, on a computer or whatever they have, to signal abuse without having to tip off the abuser, as you guys have all kind of talked about. So I'd be very interested in crafting some sort of legislation, assuming that we get the rural broadband connectivity, and even if we don't, uh, doing something that can that can uh, be a tool for kids, especially that are exploited, to um, uh, to and. You know, it doesn't have to be kids, anybody. Uh, something on the internet where they can they can just go to a portal or whatever, uh, a text number they can go to that they can get they then go to all of you to, to your centers to get help help them get the help. So 
I uh, just want to hear what you think about that and see what you think of, about that as a possible solution to this. Right. Again, Camille, you want to start and then we'll go to uh, Michelle and then April and then Alejandra. Sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, access to uh, broadly <clears throat> really crit critical, especially for children's safety. And I think that COVID's really brought that to the forefront of all of our attention where we might not have realized how it was impacting protection for children in the same way that we do now. We have a real appreciation for that. Um, I know that there are a lot of uh, children who face uh, food security issues and um, poverty issues. And I think that it's really important. Um, I'm very excited to be able to uh, after this meeting to be able to reach out to Alondra and talk about ways that RAIN can partner with YWCA to get to those children that do not have access right now and to provide the materials they need. So in their, in their um, food delivery or summer camps and all of those ways that YWCA has eyes on these kids in a way that other people don't so that they know where to go. Um, and again, I, I would be more than happy to work with all of you on a technological solution, whether it's texting or a universal red button, for lack of a better word, um, any way that we can increase access to that connection for children between them and safety um, online. I think that that's really critical to uh, keep that conversation and looking forward to working with all of you on a solution for that. Absolutely. Great. Great, thank you. Michelle, anything to add there? Um, yeah, uh, obviously making it easier um, for, for individuals, particularly children, to uh, get access to help is, is critical. And, um, you know, one thing that has struck us also as we're watching the types of cases that are coming, it was what mid early March when all of a sudden the children were just told they're not going back to school tomorrow. And here we are three months later and yeah. now they're, you know, parents are struggling all of a sudden balancing everything um, if they are home. Um, and all of a sudden, all of our safety messages kind of get thrown out the window in the sense that we are now normalizing for children five, six, seven years old sitting in front of a video camera um, and you know things that parents and families um, for years were trying to hold off maybe when you're 13 you can do that so we now have to rethink um, you know yeah. the messages that we're putting in front of our, our children and parents quite frankly uh, so we can better protect recognizing now we've just been thrust into a new world of connectivity um, particularly with video and that raises considerable risk to our youth um, not only um, uh, to your point representative of having a great place for them um, to easily report, but also we have to shift and pivot on our prevention messages because the threats have changed very, very quickly um, for all children. Hey, Michelle, uh, well said, and I totally agree. I, that's a lot, as, as, a, as a side note, I'm very good friends with John Walsh, and he lives only about 10 minutes from me. He's a good guy. Oh, excellent. Really excellent. good guy. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, he's a good man. Is that Adam's father that helped yes. to start the organization? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's extraordinary advocacy to end up with this organization that many years later. That's really. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Now he's got me to do a bunch of 100 mile bike rides, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's an adventure. <laughs> Thank you. All right. uh, April, Dr. Alexander, anything you want to add? Yeah, just um, again, I want to echo everybody's comments so far, uh, just wanting to know how we can better use our technology for good. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been on a series of other webinars with the community about access to mental health care, access to substance use care, other legislative town halls, and people are attending. Uh, that some of these um, uh, webinars have had over 200 people on them. And wow. what is the common question on these chats? Where do I get services? Uh, so wouldn't it be nice on Zoom right now, I'm floating around, if there was a tab that told you about your local resources, told you where to get support about suicide, um, su suicidal ideations, told you about who to contact uh, for abuse, and just be interconnected in these platforms because uh, I'm getting those questions constantly in the last few months. Um, so wondering where is the easy way for a person just to click uh, something on here and have all of that information at their disposal? Well, when you consider the increased traffic, I think there's a responsibility of the tech company, companies to step up for this. So, and uh, Alejandra Castillo, do you want to? 
have the last yeah, question? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. This is a great question. First of all, I, I, I wanna talk about many many uh, tech companies and, and, and companies in terms of communication always talk about the last mile. And I take a bit of umbrage because no community should ever be considered the last mile. And I talk about, you know, rural America is considered their last mile. Um, and we're when we talk about underserved communities, we need to make sure that every community is connected. I also want to talk about um, the issue of that not all connectivity is the same. We've had some challenges in terms of platforms that uh, offer confidentiality so that we have secured platforms that can actually allow us to provide the, the requisite counseling and services um, that is not going to be prone to um, any type of uh, security violation or confidentiality violation. But I also want to address the issue of um, technol uh, technology literacy. If we're going to uh, provide uh, more services through technology, how do we teach our young folks uh, about the, the right way to use technology, when to use it, who to trust uh, uh, through, that through that process? And then finally, how does the federal government uh, restructure its way to allow organizations like ours to be able to um, restructure our programs in a virtual in a virtual sense, so that it's not all in person. And currently, we're still um, the way the federal government is structuring some of its grants is still in a very in person um, pre COVID mentality. So that it's going to take some time to transition, but um, there's a lot to be done and a lot of um, issues to address. But I'm I'm hopeful and I, and I thank I thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I think we're getting close to about an hour. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Castillo, for bringing that up. That's a, another point for us to look at. We talked about that pre-COVID, post-COVID world. And often it's the Congress incentivizing certain behaviors. And I've certainly had a lot of conversations with mental health and with substance abuse uh, providers. The waivers that are going on right now that are offering flexibility are leading to some really successful connections and relationships. Certainly we've talked about telehealth and mental health. Um, there are some struggles, I, I think particularly with seniors. I have doctors that are reimbursed $120 if there's video and audio. But if it happens to an elderly senior that can't figure it all out or, or doesn't have access to the video, they get reimbursed $12. And, and so that, you know, is going to incentivize certain behavior. People without video aren't going to be able to get a doctor's appointment. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. And it's something that we can be mindful of as we move forward with this funding. Um, I think our task force, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Representative Joyce, Representative Spear, Representative Katko. Thank you to Ms. Dingle. Uh, Ms. Dingle, are you still on the line by chance on audio? No, I think she had to go to something else. Um, we do have uh, dozens of members, so that we're a robust, and I really want to emphasize bipartisan uh, approach on these issues. And I thank my colleagues because our, our legislation is stronger because of that, and we're having greater success. Um, so if you, any of you, members included, have specific ideas for legislation moving forward, please uh, feel free to reach out to Sam Cooperwall in my team. And we keep an ongoing agenda of bipartisan bills. We encourage all of our members to get a bipartisan call to work toward getting, uh, getting these passed into law. And I will specifically follow up with Rep. Spear um, to see if we could convene the tech companies for this conversation. So I think it's a really, really great idea that came out of this. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Have a very good day. Please be safe. Uh, God bless. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.